Hello, everybody. My name's James, and welcome to the fan view, um, which I've decided to call this, so we can get the fan perspective on what's happening from one of our current correspondents, what's happening at their club. And obviously, the big news early last week was Chelsea's dismissal of Thomas Tuchel and the appointment of Graham Potter. I'm delighted to say our Chelsea correspondent, Gary Mantle, joins me today. How are you, Gary? Hello, mate. Yeah, not bad. I'm glad I've had a week to process everything because it's taken me at least that long. Yeah, good man. There's plenty to, to cover off. So I kind of want to take this as a little bit of a, a journey with you, if I may, um, and reflect back all the way to when Tuchel was appointed originally, um, obviously taken over from Frank Lampard. Do you remember how you felt at that point as a fan? I remember at the time that we sacked Frank Lampard, to be honest, we knew that we were going to sack him. We could tell from the previous result. I remember I was saying to people on WhatsApp, he'll be gone before our next league game, which was Wolves. And he was. We were still disappointed. And to be honest, we didn't really know that much about Tommy Tuchel. So we thought, well, we're just appointing someone. Don't know what he's going to do. Is he going to come top four? Probably. And that'll be it. And then we'll see next season. So pretty much we had relatively low expectations for the first four months. We were a bit sort of miffed that we'd hoped we were going to do some sort of like Lampard project and that clearly wasn't going to happen. Yeah, I mean, reflecting on Lampard's spell, I think you're right. We all had a feeling it was it was coming to the end, but only, I think, six weeks earlier, you've been top of the league, I think. That's right, yeah. Um, he'd got you into the Champions League in his first season, Lampard, despite having no money to spend, basically, because you were under a transfer embargo. Yep. Got you to top of the league. You'd had a really bad month. Why, why did it feel inevitable that he would get sacked in hindsight? Good. Because we've seen it all before. Um, and sometimes you can tell from a sort of collective body language from the players that they're sort of going, okay, they're, they're not quite putting in the same sort of effort as they used to be doing. And there's more and more players start getting frozen out. Um, so under Lampard, it was like Marcus Alonso hadn't played for ages. Jorginho wasn't really making the team. And it sort of starts heading down a certain direction. Then when sometimes you think, well, he might be right because the players that he's still playing uh, are proving that they're the ones that are good enough and the ones that he aren't playing aren't. When that starts going wrong, we know that Chelsea themselves are pretty quick at um, making the change. So if you asked any fan at the time, would you get rid of Lampard? Absolutely not. But so it's not up to us, is it? No, no, I get that because obviously Lampard obviously meant so much to you in terms of from his playing career with a the club. There's more of an emotional attachment than you would have had with you know, even people say like Mourinho and Ancelotti and, and Conte yeah. who obviously won the title with you. It means more. You probably wanted him to be successful more than anybody else you'd had, I would guess, on reflection of that. Yep, but it, it was a different mantra from the club to kind of go for that young, unproven English manager. Do you reflect on that and obviously the way the club's going now that that helped build the bridge for this now with with what's to come with Graham Potter? I think it probably did. Um, it was it was pretty necessary at the time that Lampard when Lampard took over, and it sounds strange to say it now, but we weren't really at the top of like a lot of managers' lists. I mean, we just had a transfer ban. We won the Europa League, but we had um, qualified for the Champions League. They weren't looking at, oh, I'll go into Chelsea and I'll get like X amount of money to spend. You're going to go into Chelsea and you've got to put players in your team who were playing in a championship. So Mason Mount, Reese James were playing and playing in a championship. I can't remember where Tammy had been playing. Was he also in the championship? I think he was. Oh, it's Swansea, I want to say, maybe. Yeah. Um, or... I think the loan spell with Swansea in the Premier League, wasn't it? I think. Was it that? I can't remember which order I he did so. it. But any, anyway. Um, so anyway, he's got to integrate all of these players. And if you were, if you're, let's say even if you're someone like Thomas Ducal, he hasn't heard of these players, how is he going to do it? Frank Lampard, it wasn't just Frank Lampard, it was Jody Morris as well, who used to be the youth team manager. So this project really suited them. And what they achieved in the first year, I don't think somebody else would have necessarily achieved, or not to the same level. I don't know that somebody else would have got us in the Champions League. They might have come fifth or sixth and everyone would have gone, oh, well, yeah, but you did lose Eden Hazard and everyone's getting older, so that's acceptable. So they were brought in to do a specific task at a specific time, and they did it. We sort of naively thought they were brought in to do a project. Well, they weren't really. They were brought in 
to bridge that gap. As you say, the fruits of that are that now these are our best players, the players that they brought through. Reese James is one of the best players in the team, if not yeah. the best player in the team, given how often we're missing the actual best player, which is N'Golo Kante. Uh, Mason Mount hasn't shown it this season, but every manager that he's ever played under has made him crucial to the team. So he's he's one of our best players, obviously. So, yeah, as you say, this started from Frank Lampard and Jody Morris. So after that first season where Lampard qualified for the Champions League, there was a splurge of money based on the previous year. Christian Pulisic had been brought in the the January, but obviously then joined officially in the in the summer, if I remember correctly. It was Mendy, Thiago Silva, Kai Havertz, Timo Werner. Pulisic was the year before. He'd been bought... Oh, was it? Yeah, so he was able to play for us. Right. Like, but yeah. So there was a lot of money spent. There was yeah. a thought when Tuchel took over, and we discussed this with, with Ted Moore, rotation FPL at the time, that was Tuchel an appointment to try and get the best out of these German players that were at the club at the time. Did it feel a bit like that to you? When uh, when they sat Lampard and they, we started looking through the list of like who was likely to take over, I was like, it's going to be him. It's going to be Tommy Tuchel. And that's that's the reason why. Um, I, it's the same. It's a very similar to approach to when we appointed Rafa Benitez because we had Fernando Torres and we couldn't get the best out of him. So we appointed a manager that we thought we could get the best out of him. I don't. I mean, I'm sure there was way more to it than that. But it, has, it, has Cucurella it been similar. really underperforming that badly? <laughs> <laughs> he's been all right, actually. No, I know no, he's is. good. He's good. But um, yeah, it, I, I do think there was a an element of that. But also, um, I think they'd probably done their research. And if we're being honest, obviously, Tuca was a better manager than Frank Lampard. Obviously, Frank Lampard's got a lot less experience for one thing. But yeah, anyway. Were you of all the comparisons? Were you one of the lucky souls in Porto? Yeah, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Like, and that was actually I was going to say it was our. It wasn't our first game in front of fans. It was our third game in front of fans. I managed to go to all three of the games. So that was the first one was the FA Cup final. That we don't need to talk about. And then there was Leicester in the league, and then there was Porto. Porto was like unbelievable. It was weird because um, it was still very much like COVID and. You sort of kept on going between, oh, yeah, it's, it's Porto, so it's sunny, so everyone's outdoors, so there's no COVID restriction to, oh, hang on, there's only like 6,000 of us in the ground or whatever. But what a night. Unbelievable. I say what a night. I had to get a plane straight back because UEFA men said that 90% of us had to just go in and out. Yeah, but that's a separate thing. But um, anyway, the celebrations themselves were like unbelievable, and it felt like, Tuchel really wanted to start building a connection with the fans, from particularly from that moment. In fact, because I've obviously I was there, so I didn't see this at the time. But I think there's a like a bit where Glenn Hoddle's saying, "Oh, what's Tuchel doing? Why is he like playing up to the fans and all of this? He should be concentrating on the game or something like that." Well, because that was what he'd been waiting for. Tuchel'd been there for like yeah, that's four months. Yeah, he want he was like, "I want to feel the energy from the fans, and I want to like." then use that, you know, to help motivate the players and everything like that. So um, it felt like we were building something together, obviously, particularly because we won the trophy that day. Yeah, absolutely. For those who haven't read Between the Lines, we're obviously talking about the Champions League final victory against Manchester City. So at that point, are you thinking this is the start of a new dynasty? Now, instead instead of the English manager and the local lad, Frank Lampard, it's now just Thomas Tuchel's come in. He's won the Champions League within four months. Admittedly, this wasn't the first time it happened. Similar happened with obviously Roberto Di Matteo. Did this feel different to that in the sense that this was going to be a, a longer period then with Tuchel? Had you now gone to this, oh, this might be the one that's going to be here four or five years? Yeah, so with Di Matteo, like, we could all see that this is an inexperienced manager that's come in that has managed to ride on the crest of a wave, won the Champions League, sometimes like through luck. Um Whereas with Tuchel, when we, every single knockout tie, and these are like Atletico Madrid and Real Madrid and stuff, we dominated all of those games. We never looked like we were going to lose any of them. And then we uh, obviously don't even let in a goal in the final. So you're like, okay, this guy really knows what he's doing. This is like a tactical sort of like genius, if you want to say. So you're thinking, right, what's the next step? Win the title we haven't won it for a long time now. This is the longest that we've gone since Abramovich came in without winning the title. Um, and 
I always look at it as which one do you want to win the Premier League or the Champions League? Generally, I always put the Premier League first. And then when you win the Premier League, then you go, right, I want to win the Champions League. Then once you win the Champions League, you kind of want to win, almost sort of want to win the one that we haven't won recently kind of thing. But also, I don't like to go too long without winning the Premier League. So that was the hope after the Champions League was, right, let's build on this. Let's win the title. Um, and in that respect, I guess that wasn't going to happen this season either. No, but you were certainly in the running last season. I know that kind of fell off once we got into winter and once you lost at the yes, he had in January, the distance then looked looked way too big. Um, yeah. Tuchel obviously had to deal, though. I mean, it's worth saying you playing against two super opponents in City, Liverpool, that mm-hmm. if you you had too many draws. You yeah, had too absolutely. many draws. Yeah, and one of the things I mentioned in the pre-season pod was that I thought we needed to score more goals. Somebody then came back and pointed out that we were the third top scorers. You're like, well, yeah, that's true, but you finish first. This is, <laughs> this is how, yeah, exactly. But this is how good City and Liverpool are. Like, we scored seventy-six goals, I think it was. So we've scored an average of two a game. But you I think still City need to got score ninety-nine, more. didn't they? This is it. This is yeah. how. This is how high the standard is now. That yeah, you can't look at it and go that it's that bad when you're averaging like two a game or something like that. But you still think this is an insane team that we've got to get above. And the only way we're going to do it is by turning those draws into wins, do that with more goals. Um, I was, yeah, as I said, at the time I was fearful that it wasn't going to happen. That seems to be true as well. Um, but yeah, this was, this was the hope. This is what we wanted. We wanted to push on and mount a proper title challenge. And as you say, last season was, call it an asterisk season, whatever you want to call it for us. There was a lot of extenuating circumstances. We thought, all right, maybe this year. Yeah, of course, with, with obviously the sanction of the club, which I think all of us think that Tuchel handed incredibly well Absolutely. in the sense yep. that he kept getting put in front of the cameras when there was no one above him to to speak on behalf of the club, basically. And he handled himself absolutely brilliantly. He's arguably one of the best representations of Chelsea Football Club. I've seen that, you know, you're an enemy to me, if you will. We dislike each other. It's it's well known. But actually yeah. looking going, I, I can't have anything but respect for you. No, absolutely. The way that you're speaking. And did that, that felt at that time that that even bonded two corner fans even closer. Is that fair? I mean, we're only going back six months here. That's absolutely fair. Yeah, it did completely. And the fans were like fully behind him because obviously at the time, uh, with everything that was going on with Abramovich, the mood towards him is changing. And don't get me wrong, no one's ever going to be like slagging him off. But let's say like the the support behind him is starting to wane a little bit based on things that have nothing to do with football, obviously. So you're like, it's not as if they think less of what he's done to Chelsea, but they don't feel like they can support him as much kind of thing. So who are we going to get behind? We're going to get behind Tuchel because his interviews are amazing. That's why I can't even remember exactly which match it was, but towards the end of last season, he had a, like a full stand length banner that was unveiled. Like the and he was so happy with one. it as well. Yeah, that's Most it. of us have seen the images of that, yeah. That's right. I mean, I say stand length, it's the shed, and you know that. Stand is not that big, but still, it's a it's a, de- it's a decent it's a decent sized banner. Yeah, and he was delighted. It is the shed of football stands. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, and but that that shows you that's that's the connection that that we were that we had with him. That he's yeah he's someone that we hadn't not that we hadn't heard of, but that we didn't really know much about who's come in, who's won us the Champions League, who's built a, a rapport with the fans, who's then sort of like gone into bat for the club and to us mainly if you're like essentially if you're defending the club you're defending the fans because we're the ones that are getting it in the neck particularly when the owner's not visible which we understand but the people below him like Bruce Buck like come on man come and show your face but he wasn't you're like so then everything that anybody says is then on us because we're the ones that are visible aren't we we're the ones that are at the matches yeah so when he comes out and like defends you you're like wow yeah okay a lot of respect for this guy love this guy Let's, uh, yeah. let's build on that for next season. So it's completely understandable that results tailed off at the end of that season. Um, you still finish runners-up in both domestic cup competitions, losing narrowly on penalties to the phenomenal Liverpool team. You ever so nearly turned over this deficit in the Bernabeu, put in a sensational performance, um, which would have obviously got you into the Champions League semi-finals and then who knows again from there. 
So I think it was understandable the way the season tailed off, which you very much was keen to get the message across in the summer. Like, don't overly judge us on the back end of last season's league results. Like, mm-hmm. top four was assured. There were yeah, other things it. going on. And yet, when we spoke for Correspondent Week, we knew something was alarmingly wrong, despite the fact the football club was now on a sound footing in terms of the takeover that's obviously gone through and stuff. Why, why was that in reflection? What happened there with the defeat at, to Arsenal win in pre-season? And for you to know that the signs were bad, despite at the same time wanting to give a defence for the way the previous season had finished. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I was thinking, I was trying to think back to that. I never I never actually like watched it back recently or anything like that. But I was thinking the tone of like the uh, correspondent we won, it was like fairly negative. Now, another thing that you do have to, you do have to like uh, sort of, factor in that as I've said my hope originally was we're building something let's build to challenge for the title and it became clear that we weren't going to challenge for the title so when I say that we're going to have a bad season that means we're not going to challenge for the title it doesn't mean we're going to come fifth or sixth necessarily so because of our, our hope is up here our expectation is then down there and it makes it like a little bit negative whereas other clubs would be like oh I'd love to be in your position kind of thing yeah. I get that so um the uh the Arsenal result itself was bad, but everything around it was also bad. And I think what I'd hoped was, uh, it seemed that Tuchel would hope this as well, that everything, as we said, at the end of last season, with all the defeats and everything, was done. Line under that, let's start afresh. And we played that game and we did not start afresh. We looked exactly like the team that was like, sort of, going not quite going through the motion sort of thing but you know it wasn't the commitment wasn't quite there the like application wasn't there so that's like that's carried on and then Tuchel comes out and he's complaining about not having the players and everything like this which is strange because when we won the Champions League we didn't win the Champions League because we had the best players we won the Champions League because he set us up tactically to get the most out of those players and to shut down some other teams based on like who their best players are. So you think, oh, hang on, why do you need like X, Y, and Z? And I get, obviously, we lost a few players. We lost Christensen, we lost Rudiger and whatever. But it's like, is it that important? Have we not got enough at the club that we can work with, given that he'd shown that he could work with a lot of players like Trevor Chalaber, like at the end of last season and stuff like that. And then he was almost like sort of trying to like freeze him out. So it did seem, it seemed a bit strange. It seemed like a, a little bit, things were starting to like not add up. And in hindsight now, because I remember one of the things I'd said was um, off the back of that defeat was, was he trying to send a message to the owners? And now it like looks more like he probably was in some way, whatever that message was, whether it was, I need new players or you guys have been ringing me all day, every day and I haven't had time to do the tactics. And now look what's happened. Like, I don't know what it was, but there was, you can now tell the conflict had already started it was like that the performance wasn't the kind of performance that we associate with Tuchel that we associate with Chelsea um the interview well that sort of started becoming more of a Tuchel trademark he loves a whinge in an interview and actually he's like skipping forward a little bit more I said after the um Zagreb match I was like that's weird he's come out and been quite calm in his interview and said oh yeah I need to improve this and this and this and then but then the next day he was gone. So he like, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think the only thing is on that, uh, the Zagreb result wasn't as bad as the Zagreb result that my team had in no. Zagreb a couple of years ago. Um, yeah. And you don't have to win all six Champions League games to in, in a group to, to get through. And you know, you'll still be sitting there confident you'll get out of the group. I'm fairly certain of that. Okay, yes, yeah. maybe finishing first is going to be more of a challenge now, for example. But it's not crisis from a Champions League perspective. No, no. And neither is the results that you've had at Leeds and Southampton in terms of trying to make up the ground on those who are ahead of you to try and finish in the top four again. But we have had these results. If I reflect on the results this season, we spoke to you before the Tottenham game. The performance at Everton wasn't great, but it had the hallmarks of a champion's result. Not brilliant. Opening day, a a ground where you don't normally get a result. Ironically, you won 1-0. Fine, forget about it. It didn't feel right, though. Then you played my team Tottenham in game week two. You battered us, should have won. 
And then I'm reflecting on that going, oh, they're still the third best team in this league. No drama, no problem. Then you go to Leeds. What happened, mate? Well, one of the things that happened, and like I don't have a lot of criticisms of Tuchel at all, but one of the things that happened is that N'Golo Kante got injured. Now, I think he's always struggled to get us playing well without N'Golo Kante. And a lot of the time last season that we were getting these draws, it was when Kante was injured. And it almost seemed like a lot of the tactical plan worked because Kante was doing what he was doing in midfield. And part of that is probably because of the limitations of Jorginho, that you need somebody like Kante who's going to make up for those limitations. You take Kante out of the team and Jorginho is just horribly exposed. And that's why we've seen him in subsequent games we've put an extra body in midfield. Like we've played Gallagher and Loftus-Cheek both in the centre because he's realising, shit, this doesn't work as soon as Kante's gone. And that, I mean, that was that was part of the problem. Um, obviously, that was Gallagher's sort of it, debut. It, it does get magnified well. by the fact, it does feel like when Kante plays a lot of the time, you have 12 players. Yeah, that's it's right. not an easy player to replace. Of course. And when he's there, you're going to like, you're going to build the team essentially around him and you're going to play players to do a certain job that you know they can do because Kante is going to cover the bits that they can't do sort of thing. And this this was apparent even in his first season when Tuchel came in. We didn't lose many games. But every game we lost, Kante didn't play. And he was man of the match in like Champions League quarterfinals, semifinals, finals, everything like that. And now he's injured again. But we knew he was going to get injured. I said in pre-season. He's injury prone. He's going to get injured. I'd yeah, hope he's, he'd last he's more not going to play weeks. 60 games for you no, anymore, mate. No. He's not. No, that's it. So we had to come up with a plan and it always seemed like he was he was struggling to 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 make it well to, to make it work without him even down to the fact at the end of last season when he was like giving his interviews he mentioned how little Kante had played. And this, and you think right, he's right. Kante is the best player on the team. But we have to accept that he's not going to be fit. And you have to get over the fact that he's not going to be available and build something that might work. And I'm sure it's not just that. But I do think that's a massive part of it. So what the owners of, of it's been reported um, by certain, let's say, ITK journalists, that they've been looking at this 100-game Tuchel spell, where in the first 50 games you conceded 24 goals and in the most recent 50 you conceded 53 which is obviously more than double. Um, how do you view that, reflecting on it now that he's gone? Because that's not just, okay, we took our eye off the ball for the league games at the end of the season. I realise there's a few in there, like four against Brentford, four against Arsenal, that make that statistic look worse. But even still, if you remove those two and it's 45 conceded rather than 24, it's still a big jump, for example. How do you view that on reflection? Has this actually been coming for, for quite a long time then, that it's been on the decline? Uh, I think it probably has, to be honest. Yeah. I. There seemed to be, when he, when Tuchel came in, there was this like, aura about our defence. Like, yeah. Like, we, we, sometimes, sometimes, when you know, when fans like to have a go at other fans, they go, oh, you played like, such a weak Madrid side and all of this. It's like, what, the same Madrid side that knocked Liverpool out, like, you know, a couple of, rounds before and stuff like that. They didn't get near us. I think Benzema scored a bicycle kick. In Porto, they scored a bicycle kick. This is how we let our two goals in the Champions League. In every other team, in every other game, they couldn't get near us. We played a lot of league games. We played Liverpool away and they didn't get near us at Anfield. Obviously, this is like when there's no fans and everything like this. So there was there was some sort of like block that we had formed, some sort of way that we were playing that made teams think that they couldn't score against us. And that had completely gone. Like we, Why? we were going into games. Honestly, I don't know, because it's it will start with certain things. As I say, one of the things it probably starts with is you don't have your defensive screen in Kante. So then you start giving up a few more chances. And the problem then is that the confidence starts going. So when like up until November last year, Mendy had been incredible, absolutely like phenomenal. And the times that we did need him to save us, he saved us. In fact, even when we played City at home and we lost 1-0, he was still one of our best players. He was the one that kept it down to 1-0 and he was like making good saves, like all of this kind of stuff. And then the game that it all changed was Juventus at home when we beat them 
but Chilwell got injured and Kante got injured. And I don't know how many Tuchel games that is, but it's going to be around about 50. And from then on, uh, the next game is Man United, who we drew with at home, and then it's Watford away, scrappy win. And then we yeah, go to the West well that night. No way. That was the worst I'd seen us play. Yeah. And this was bearing in mind that we played like City and lost. And like even Liverpool, we played with 10 men and we still played better than, than we did at Watford. We were awful at Watford. I think they had more of the ball. But oh, it's something close. So anyway, that was when you like you think, all right, yeah, a couple of bad results. We'll, but we'll switch this around. And this is before the sanctions and everything. And we just never did. And it kind of sort of started spiralling. So this is now when COVID kicks in again. And we had like the famous game at Wolves where half of our squad was out, but we yeah. still had to play the game because they wouldn't let us rearrange it because we'd have too much fixture congestion. And they're going, oh, well, Kovacic and Kante are fit. But they haven't played in like two months and one month, like respectively. So they're not fit. They're available, but they're not fit. And anyway, so it it, it sort of started from there. And we just never got it back. It seemed that by then, once things had started going downhill, he never quite managed to like switch it around and get the confidence back and get Mendy playing like how he used That's to. That's despite the fact that I think in the in the kind of going into early of this year, 2022, there were things that should have lifted the club. Like, I mean, you destroyed us, what, three times in, in January? Um, yeah. Didn't concede a goal against us. It, it's the big derby game for you. So there's three games there that are going to make the fans put in really good mood. You won yep. the Club World Cup. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, part of beating Tottenham was you've got another trip to Wembley in the Carabao Cup final. So it felt like uh, amongst these kind of like league results and draws and things, but there were things around the club that should have put it in a, a positive nature. And it still felt that way to me on the outside. Oh, things are positive at Chelsea. Okay, yeah, they're not going to win the title this year, but it's all right. That's how it felt to me. I certainly wasn't thinking in back in January, February, that we'd get to a point where by the summer I was thinking, I bet Thomas Tuchel doesn't make 23-24, for example. Well, despite your pre-season prediction. No, but, but I'm uh, saying back in January, February, no, I didn't oh, think yeah, that. Okay, yeah, no. No, I, I get that. And I didn't either. And also, so obviously we have to remember, that's before everything happened with Abramovich as well. Yeah. So, yeah, you... The sort of thought was, all right, there's a there's been a blip because of, and let's be honest as well, a blip for Chelsea just means that we're not winning. We weren't losing. Yeah, we only fair. lost to West Ham. We didn't lose in January. In fact, I don't think we lost in February. So, you know, do you think, it's not that bad, is it? We're just no. like, there's some games that, yeah, you needed a goal that you didn't get, or some games like Brighton, you need to close it out, and we let... The, we two draws with Brighton. That's yeah. right. And we were 1-0 up in both of them. Um, But you think, all right, yeah, so we've lost something, but we've not lost everything. You're like, yeah, and that's, that's fine. So then you're like, okay, well, we'll get everybody back and we'll we'll go back to what we were. And by the time people came back, something else had happened, which was the sanctions. So it almost was like one thing fed into another thing. You're like, once we got out of our busy winter period where we've like, players have got COVID, Lukaku's doing what he did, everything like this. Once we've like got through that, that's March. That's when we got sanctioned. So then you're like, right, now it's this. And it's almost as if, yeah, it kind of became too much on him and on the players. Fast forward to six days ago. News comes through early in the morning, the day after the defeat in Zagreb that he's been sacked. What was your initial reaction? How did you feel when you when you heard that news? Shock. Shock was the initial reaction. So I found out through Slack. Somebody put it in the Chelsea group. I think it was Phil. It Walker. will only take seconds for the news to be in there, mate. As you of know. course, that's it. But I'm like, nah, that's fake. He's been done. So when I, I got a WhatsApp, and my first instinct was someone's. It's fake news. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I went on official Chelsea account. Oh fuck! And I think that's the WhatsApp that I sent to a lot of people was, oh fuck. In fact, I probably put it in the Slack. I can't remember. But yeah, that was that's the initial reaction. Like, oh fuck! Like, I didn't, I didn't expect it. Um, that was then. That's the, that's the in the moment. What's going on? Like, don't understand it. Things aren't like that bad. But since then, reading more and more into it, it's become more and more understandable, and the more like 
let's say, at peace with what's happened. We'll, we'll talk about some of them understandables, but fast, obviously at the time, shock. And I yep. presume your immediate emotion was like, that's wrong. W- would that be fair or? Yeah. From a fan perspective. Yeah. Just remove yeah, all the stuff you've learned this week. Moving forward now to today, do you reflect on it and think it's the right decision? I think it was inevitable. Yeah. Like from what from what I've read about, the main thing is the complete breakdown of communication between the ownership and the manager. That's only going to go one way. Um, I think I'm still slightly confused by the timing because you think, well, after you spent all that money. Yeah, and you're like, well, if they didn't want him, then get rid of him before we've done all of that. Or if they are going to give him a chance, then actually give him a chance. But this is like somewhere in the middle. So, I don't know. That That's the only bit that confuses me. But other than that, yeah, I don't know, kind of like... I think that that's what caught this. everybody really by shock was the timing. Yeah. So, you hadn't played great against West Ham uh, the previous no. weekend, but one. Um, then obviously the defeat comes in Zagreb and your initial reaction is they surely they've not sacked him on the one Zagreb and you think okay there was Leeds Southampton as well okay that is a little run of bad results for for a club of your size and stuff but but then, hang on they've just just bought Fofana last week just bought Aubameyang last week he hasn't tried to get these two into the, the club you still need to integrate people like Kula Bali etc for a longer period um it, it just feels wrong like that that was my first instinct, honestly, was great. Yeah. Because as a as a competitive fan, I, in my head, I'm I, I know they're not in a great period at the moment, but I I still think Thomas Tuchel's an elite manager. Whatever they get, and I'm sure I put this on the Slack on the day, whatever you get is probably not going to be better. And it might be that Potter does turn out to be better, by the way. But that was my initial reaction: was Chelsea just let go of an elite manager because of a little bit of a bad spell? Doesn't make sense, but. I've done the same. You read everything that I've most of us would have read over the last week. And for actually, yeah, this was this was inevitable. Tell us a little bit from the, there's two sides to this story, obviously. The yep. two cool perspective first of what the breakdown was and why things began to change for him, if you can. So the the uh, breakdown probably started the day that Czech left because now there's nobody in between the owner and the manager, which these days is unique. Like in the past, that was fine. That was normal. Manager talks to the chairman, they go through things together and and all this kind of stuff. That doesn't happen anymore. So now when the uh, ownership wants something, they come straight to Tuchel. Well, Tuchel doesn't want to be hassled. He doesn't want the ownership. He doesn't want to have to explain himself. He almost... I don't know. I've not seen it written like this way, but he probably like looks at Bowley as like some sort of three-year-old that just keeps on asking questions. And he's like, can you just leave me alone? Like, I don't want to keep on explaining like why and why and why. I just want to poach the team. So he's now thinking, okay, there's a lot more interference. And it's not in the not in the playing side at all. Bowley's never tried. Well, I know there's this thing about the 4 4 3. <laughs> I was going to say, but, you need to mention that, mate. Of course. Um, but I don't think that was him trying to pick the team he wasn't saying this is how you need to play he's saying oh we want these players and this is how they would fit in and this is why we would want them kind of thing and two's was like right a there's too many players on the pitch and b i don't want to deal with this with you like i want to go um go and coach that's what i am yeah. i'm a coach so he's he's now like it seems irritated and then to the point that he then stopped like answering the phone and they would call him in for meetings and he sent his agent into the meetings instead because yeah. he's like, yeah, I don't I don't want to have to deal with this. And from that point of view, you're like, yeah, it's probably fair enough, to be honest. Like, he'd, he'd never yeah. had to do it before. He was, he, he, I don't think he's, him being like a very modern manager has probably never, ever had to do this. Do you think though, I mean, Bolly, uh, uh, Todd Bolly, who's obviously, uh, is, he, is he the face of the club now? Is- yeah, but in all of the things, there's like Bed Adek Bali as well, who's actually yeah. more, his company owns more of a stake. So that's Clear Lake. Okay. So they have more of a stake in Chelsea, but Bowley's kind of taken it over, taken it upon himself. But also he is the sporting director. He's doing both jobs. It's, it's, it's not even that he's, he's given it, he's given himself that title, interim sporting director. Yes. 
which Gary. but in fairness is obviously completely alien to him many people have heard the, the, the Gary Neville comment it's like he's playing football manager basically he's just throwing shit at a wall here basically but I, I can understand from his point of view I mean putting himself in that interim position I think you'd have probably been better off throwing some money at someone else to who got the experience to do the job for six months or a year to bridge the gap presumably from his point of view though going in and trying to do that job with no experience he wanted to lean on Tuchel to get his opinion that he's doing things right but I guess from Tuchel's perspective Tuchel's like I've not done this before I want to be on the training pitch etc and the rumours of this 4-4-3 which supposedly was shown to him I mean at that point you would think shut the fuck up mate like what what are you what are you doing to me? Are you wasting my time? So yeah. I get that. There was other things I read about them being on the flight with the team and stuff. I, I think, and to be fair, I have heard this happen with Tottenham where Daniel Levy will, will be on the flight with, with the players and stuff for away European games and stuff. But this idea that coming back from Zagreb, all the players and the manager are walking back past the owners and stuff and they're sitting there and no one's talking to each other. Does feel like you're, you're on my toes here too much yeah. basically I think from Tuchel's perspective right yeah and and that that is true but as you say if you look at it from Burley's perspective what yeah. else is he going to do he doesn't know what he's doing he's like he's trying you cannot fault the effort that he's put into Chelsea like how many times have we seen American like owners particularly American like come in and then you never see them again because they they all own other clubs in America and bear in mind we're getting towards the end of the baseball season as well now so it's like it's getting to be crunch time there. But he's spent seemingly every waking hour trying to do deals for Chelsea, which has pissed off Gary Neville. Gary Neville, who will then say, why are the Glazers not like going and buying people from Man United? Well, which one do you want, mate? Because you're just unhappy that we're actually trying to do something that you want your club to do. So I don't I don't really see that as like a valid kind of argument from Neville. I think Bowley has like absolutely thrown himself in these days because of the prominence of journalists who like are in touch with agents you hear about deals way earlier than you ever used to hear about them so the fact that Burley had a meeting with George Mendes we already knew about that straight away this is before probably even before he's gone to Tuchel and a lot of this is to do with Ronaldo basically. that's right exactly yeah. and he's gone back to him like several times Tuchel was like do I really have to explain to you why a guy of his age can't function in a pressing system in the Premier League like these days how it's not just about his goal record but Burley's also kind of got a point he's like well but this guy scored however many goals he scored in the Premier League last season. He does sound like Bolly and his, his team have, have tried to look down analytic routes. That's right. So, whereas Tuchel very much wants to, I, I want to speak to the player before he's signed and vet him. I know Pochettino wanted to do the same thing at Tottenham, turn people away who the club were prepared to buy because it's like, mm, don't fit his personality fits, basically. Yeah. And the, the issue that we have is that there was no go between. So yeah. they're having to have these conversations themselves, whereas in the past it should be, he's going to pet a check. If Tuchel explains this to Czech, he doesn't have to explain it to him again and again and again. He's like, he's told him, Czech's going to go, all right, yeah, no, I see your point. Todd will go back to Czech and then he'll go, no, no, honestly, look, this is how we want to play. Yes, Ronaldo can do this, but he can't do this. And this is what we need him to do as well. So it's just not going to work. Um, and it seems that they had come to a point where they'd just gone, it had gone too far. The yeah. communication is just, just completely like... Yeah, it sounds like finished. after the Leeds game, they just completely stopped speaking. It sounds yeah. like. And at this point, the transfer window was still open. Yeah, so what we should probably should say about Aubameyang, because everybody says that that's the Tuchel signing. And he, he probably is, but he still scored goals at Barcelona. They'll still look at the uh, statistics and go, "This is we haven't just plucked Diego Costa out of nowhere. Sorry, Wolves. But this is a guy that was actually playing well in the start of the year. And I've not watched Arsenal's nothing documentary. But as far as I'm aware, he doesn't come across very well in that. Now, Thank you, Gary. My, uh, <laughs> Something we can agree on. Yeah, exactly. But a part, of the, part of the issue there is they'll go, oh, yeah, but I, I, have, uh, I haven't seen it. But as far as I'm aware, there's, there, there's obviously going to be a breakdown because they got rid of the guy. But he was captain of that club and he was the talisman of that club. And he's neither of those things at Chelsea. You've given a guy like him too much responsibility. Whereas at Chelsea, he's just another player. So you're like, is it going to be as catastrophic as it was at Arsenal? Well, it doesn't have to be because he doesn't have the same role. 
he's like one of four players that play in like the attacking three, but he's not on a pedestal. He's not the captain. He's not supposed to lead by example. We've got people to do that. So you're like, it doesn't have to be as bad as it was towards the end at Arsenal. It might not work. I'm not saying it definitely will work. He is getting on a bit and everything like that. But I don't think it's as like an awful signing as is being made out kind of thing. And I don't think it's necessarily just a Tuchel signing. This is something that David Ornstein was saying. That remember as well, by the time we signed him, we were desperate. Like how many how many strikers can you get on deadline day? Of like that have scored goals that year and are available to like make the transfer. Well, by the looks of things, there were two, Ronaldo or Aubameyang, and we weren't going to go for Ronaldo, so it had to be Aubameyang. And yeah, Tuchel is going to be more agreeable to Aubameyang than he is Ronaldo, obviously. So it's almost like the two of them were working together. But the point is, I don't think it was exclusively a Tuchel. I only want this man okay. signing, from what I've heard. Then for Fana. Fafana's a great player. Like, no, I mean, in terms of the signings happened after this supposed breakdown oh, yeah, between owner it, as, and manager. But as in, from, I, I don't know because I don't go into like, all the statistics and stuff, but I mean, if you analyse Fafana from any point of view, you're going to want to sign Fafana. Yeah. Obviously, we spend a lot of money on him. We needed a player in that position. And he, in my opinion, I've said it before and I've like, been on here, like, he was the one that, that I'd wanted as well. His like his style was perfect for the way that Chelsea want to play. Now, is that still the way we want to play? I don't know. But in terms of like a ball playing centre back, he's as comfortable as anyone that you'll find. Well, I mean, he's not because Thiago Silva is as comfortable as anyone you'll find. But he's like he's that's like the that's the direction that he's heading in a Thiago Silva kind of thing in terms of like how he wants to play now. Obviously, the Zagreb thing doesn't make him look good. Um, it was, I, I think it was his mistake for the goal, Fafana. I think he got sucked in where he didn't need to be, and we know that Thiago Silva wouldn't have done. He would have dropped off. And it's experience, isn't it? It is, and as, as I said before, I think that Fafana's used to playing like as the right centre-back, and that's that's what Tuchel would have wanted his right centre-back to do. But at the time, he's not the right centre-back. He's the centre-centre-back, and also, you're on the halfway line. So... You can't do what he did. But yeah, it wasn't like a, a huge alarm bell. Nah, the fact there was still that, a lot um, for Orsic to do before he scored. Oh fact. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And he's, he, I know that people are like, how's Fafana not like caught him up? He is also pretty quick, Orsic. Yeah. I, mean, I can't believe he's still with them, to be honest. Actually. I know, yeah, exactly. Um, a yeah. couple more questions just quickly on Tuchel before we yeah. move on to, we want to talk about Potter briefly before we finish, obviously. Um, how do you feel when Tuchel rocks up at Tottenham in 12 months? Because all your ex-managers do on a serious. Well, I'm not suggesting that's definitely going to happen, but no. I, it's more how do you emotionally feel about Tuchel now, basically, is what I'm asking. We love him. Like, we absolutely love him. It would slightly, yeah, like lessen things. It would be a strange situation because... We didn't quite have the fallout with Tuchel as we did with Mourinho. Even with Mourinho, like even to the end, we still were sort of supporting him. I don't think I'll fall out even with Conte the way I fell out with Mourinho either, mate. No, exactly. And and <laughs> and even and and also with Conte, we'd had a like that second year was like you know, it went on for a long time. So you're like, okay, this is starting to like come to to that conclusion. Whereas with Tuchel was a bit more abrupt. So I don't know. Uh, whereas, so with Mourinho, the fact that he went to Tottenham, didn't really like it, but couldn't really fault it. To be honest, if Tuchel goes to Tottenham, I can't really fault that either. We sacked him at the end of the day. Um, I'd like him to not. You sack everyone. No one leaves Chelsea. In fairness, Sarri Gary, is the only manager. Sarri's the only one that actually yeah, left Yeah, but Chelsea. if he didn't, Literally yeah, but it wasn't that to make sure you could get the money off Juventus rather than you were going to sack him, right? If you'd given it, if you'd given the choice to the fans, we would have sacked him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, yeah. He wasn't. Uh, he wasn't starting the next season with you, mate. He was going <laughs> if he if he didn't leave. Yeah. So, um, look, he's well within his rights to go there. At the moment, he's a. He, I mean, he won us the Champions League. You can't do much more than that. Um, he's he's in our bracket of our like legendary managers. In time, he's probably going to be at the bottom of that bracket. With, That's interesting. With um, Conte. Whereas Mourinho, in time, 
is still at the top. And Di Matteo is going to sit above Tuchel just because he's got the playing history of Chelsea as well. Yeah, I can get that. It's a little bit like what we said with the Lampard connection. Well, like, Di Matteo like, was there at the that. time that he played for Chelsea. He signed for us in 96 and we hadn't won a trophy in 25 years. And he was part of the team that won the first trophy. So he made us winners, helped me, and he scored the goal in the cup final and then in the League Cup final and then in the next cup final. So he's already like a legendary player. And yeah. then he comes in and wins the Champions League. So that's going to put him above him. Nobody's saying that Di Matteo is a better manager than Tuchel, but I'm saying in the, in the fans' mind, I get it. I get it. That's right. And obviously, at the moment, it's difficult to analyse that because the Tuchel thing's so fresh. And it is. And this is like this is no fault of Tuchel's at all, but he just wasn't there long enough. And he only he only won one trophy. He only won. I mean, he won the World Club Cup, I suppose, as well. Depends how much you like, how much weight you want to put behind it. Uh, I'm sure Jose would call it a trophy, wouldn't he? So take it. I mean, <laughs> he calls everything a trophy, doesn't he? But <laughs> yeah, um, he is. He's he's a legendary manager at Chelsea. I'll be disappointed when he goes to Tottenham, as he inevitably will do. Uh, <laughs> it's just a funny trend. That's all, mate. Um, right, let's move on to the current manager before we finish. So, well, actually, let's just say something there as well. Go on, because this is like somewhere in between. Is that? Pochettino was rumoured to be one of the ones that we were after. Yeah. For Chelsea. Now, there's a lot of Chelsea fans that did not want Pochettino. Why? And the reason, because he managed Tottenham. Uh, okay. He wouldn't, he wouldn't have got the same reaction as Benitez, but obviously you and I have very different Twitter timelines. And mine was a lot of people saying that they didn't want Pochettino to come to Chelsea. Yeah, no, I, 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 on reflection, yeah, I can see that. Like, would I want Wenger at Tottenham? Like, no. I mean, yeah. I mean that, that day's kind of long run, but yeah, yeah, I, I get it, yeah. And we also see it as like a, we still, well, yeah, we see ourselves as the biggest club in London. So we shouldn't have to take off casts from what we would consider to be lower clubs in London. Now, whereas, whereas, my people, t- whereas my team does, yeah. Right. Well, whether people want to believe that or not, Go or whether back people to your think it's true. Seat stadium that no, you can't make bigger. <laughs> <laughs> but, what, but what I'm saying is that whether that's true or not, or whether other people from the outside see it that way, this is how the fans feel. Yeah, whether we're it. right or not, that is how we feel. We feel like we should not be taking from Tottenham. They can come and take from us every two years, but we shouldn't have to go and take from them. So, yeah, people didn't actually want Pochettino in at Chelsea. Personally, Probably wouldn't have minded. I think it's been a while. There's water under the bridge and everything like that. But I saw, I saw a lot of opinion saying, not him. So was there a lot of opinion for Potter? There's, there is. I think especially the more that people like look into it, the more that people read about it. Um, initially, you're thinking, this is a guy who's never managed even in the Champions League. He's not even managed a small club in the Champions League. He's never managed in the Champions League. He's never won anything. And we've got players that have won the World Cup. We've got players that have won the Champions League, obviously, because they won it at Chelsea. Um, internationals with over 100 caps. What are they going to be thinking about Potter? So there is like this trepidation. But I think the more it's gone on, the more support Potter's getting from our fans. Is it because Chelsea fans want change? A Chelsea fan sick of this big name comes in, wins something, then it goes to shit, start cycle again. I don't think we are. Do do Chelsea fans want change? Like, if I said to you now, what would you prefer? Would you prefer win the FA Cup this year, for example, and he's sacked in a year? Or would you prefer not to win anything for the next two, three years, but you could see absolute progress constantly through those three years to the point that when you were getting into year four, you'd think we we could win the light league now. What what would you rather? Is it, is it of, a success now or is it, do Chelsea fans now want a longer process? Well, this is, it's a, there's a kind of different debate there because the example that you used is the FA Cup. To us, there's, there's two trophies that really matter. It's the league and the Champions League. Still a trophy, though, mate. It is still a trophy. And that's like, that's, and that's still, why I used it. That's why I didn't. Of course, pick and Premier I still league go to like. League. Obviously, I still go to like all of these cup finals, and I still want to win them and everything like that. But losing an FA Cup final is nowhere near as bad as losing a Champions League final. Um, so in terms of the specific example you get, you gave, I would rather have the long term 
I'd rather not win the FA Cup and see the progress. If you can offer me another Champions League, I'll take the Champions League. Yeah, no, I get that. But I knew you'd say that. That's why I said that. Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah. what I'm saying is you'd be happy then, potentially, not happy, but understand what I'm saying. To, to, if there's progress, you're happy for this to be a slower thing now. Is that a right. feeling? Because yeah. it feels like, you, I, I look at, you know, I think, I think Potter's absolutely brilliant. And I'm really pleased that a big club's given him this opportunity. But my instant reaction is, you won't win the league this year. No, we won't win the league this year. Whereas if you'd have pointed us a, a super big name who's got the experience of doing it, I'd look at that gap and think, well, actually, knowing from the Conte season where you had like these 13, 14 wins in a row, it could still be recoverable. At a similar stage of this season in Conte's first year, it, it was nearly as bad as it is now, right? It wasn't miles yeah. off. Man City weren't Man City then, were they? No, that's, they that's very true. Now. Like the, the the league has changed. Like Man City kicked on, and then Liverpool managed to make them kick on even further, and then the two of them just accelerated. Obviously, Liverpool have had their own troubles this year, but City just looked ridiculous. It would take injuries for even if we appointed, yeah, whoever it was. I, I don't even know who who I don't know who we could have appointed who would make me think, oh, we might win the league this year. I, like I don't think there's a big name out there that you're like oh it had to be him if he wanted the title As, and I've like ignored any thought of title anyway it's just about top four now okay same question for Champions League then because the end of the day is a cup competition mm -hmm. do you would you put yourself into contendership for it probably not but Wouldn't is that because so. of Potter yeah as in you just can't visualise it do you understand what I'm saying that's right it yeah. feels like a stretch at the moment yeah, definitely, because these, like, there's the expectation and the scrutiny at Chelsea is insane. It's like, it's it's comparable to other big clubs. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that there's anything different to us, and one would argue that it's still bigger at Manchester United than it is at Chelsea, obviously. But if we go, we've got Milan twice. If we don't get a win against Milan, even if we go to to San Siro and lose, he's still going to get asked questions about how have you how have you lost to like Milan and San Siro. It's like this is one of the like a European like heavyweight. You, we, you know, you can let me off losing to San Siro, can't you? Well, like, oh, actually, no, you can't. Not when you're Chelsea manager. I, so, I, I made um, a comment very recently about um, Potter and and England, and I think most English fans would have gone, yeah, I could I could see him taking that job one day. Probably less so now. Ironically, they've taken your job but being a little bit concerned about his personality with the media, kind of based on what you've just said, in the sense that he is very, very calm and stuff, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it does feel to manage one of the biggest clubs now, and you are one, that you need to have, I wouldn't say necessarily personality, an aura, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure he has it yet. It's not a criticism because he hasn't had the chance to get that aura. No. From managing Brighton, Swansea, and Ostersons, right? So we haven't we haven't seen him have that opportunity. We haven't seen him pressed into why have you lost to AC Milan? Because they haven't been in that position, for example. Um, I, I have concerns about the fact that Brighton always go on these long spells that seem to be bad, and it, it feels like if he has a bad spell like that against at Chelsea, where say you have a good three four months, and then you don't win in six games next March, it might be over. Well, we don't know that, do we? No. Because that's based that's based on what was happening under the previous regime. Yeah. And we have to say that it is completely different. And this is possibly like part of the problem is that they've literally cut everybody that was in between the ownership and the manager. Check's gone, Grand sky has gone, Buck's gone, Scott McLaughlin's gone. Like they've cleared out the whole of the Abramovich thing. So are they gonna look at everything differently? I think they probably are, to be honest. It's worth saying, the, is, is it the Dodgers they own? Yep. So the, the the manager of that team has been in charge for about six, seven years or so, hasn't he? Yeah. And that's despite not winning trophies every year. So that suggests that there possibly is some patience. Um, it also sounds like everything's going into Chelsea at the moment. And I wonder, if that, in, I wonder if that enthusiasm will last. That's the only other thing to say as well. Like, I completely agree with you. All Bolly's efforts at the moment seem to be going into Chelsea. I'm just not sure that enthusiasm is going to last once we get into year two, 
year three, etc. Well, like, there's no way of knowing. No, but also it doesn't need to because he came in with absolutely no foundation, no groundwork, and he's put that all in. And as I said, you absolutely cannot fault what he's done over the summer. But he's done that now. So he was going after like a lot of players with it's not as if in January he was able to go, oh, what about Ronaldo? Oh, no, that's not going to work. So then by the summer, he's forgotten about it. He's doing this all at once. So it does look like haphazard or whatever like that. Well, that's done. He's got his own manager in. The manager's apparently going to be have some sort of involvement in choosing the sort of sporting director, which seems a bit backwards, but maybe it'll work. I don't know. Maybe that is a better yeah, way to do this. That sporting things. director link's going to be really important i think be a bit yeah. of a changer where yes he can he can that's right away a so bit once this it. is in place once he's got his team in below him he doesn't need to do what he's done i, I, I can't imagine that burley's going to do this every summer and you wouldn't want him to because after a while you go all right there must be some sort of structure you must have done some prior research that you didn't have to spend all summer running around to like barcelona and everywhere like this to have meetings like he just didn't have an option this summer he only took over at the start of june he's only been in charge of the club for three months 100 days actually as we know don't we so um it's i think with a view to being able to step back i don't know i don't know how often he's going to come and watch chelsea i don't know what he's going to do in october when it's like the postseason in baseball is he going to still be coming to chelsea or is he just going to be watching dodgers we've no idea we've got absolutely nothing to go by here mm. but what i would say with the Potter appointment was given everything that we've heard, everything that's gone on like behind the scenes, if that was the reason for getting rid of Tuchel, then Potter is the appointment that makes sense. Yeah, I agree. As in, if it's not based on the results on the pitch, because if it was based on the results on the pitch and they go, we want a Champions League, we'll go and try and chuck a load of money at Zidane or someone like that. I know everyone says like that he wants the France job, but you know, he wasn't really considered, Potter was the number one, it seems. Potter was the main one that they went to. They had like put little like irons and fires like in other places, as you would. You don't put all your eggs in one basket. But um, he he was the main guy. I think part of that is because I think Dan Ashworth is has being like consulted unofficially. Well, despite the fact he's at Newcastle now. Despite the fact he's at Newcastle, because um, this is something that I've heard that uh, PIF invest in Clear Lake. Clear Lake are actually our majority owners. So but you're the account of Worms now, aren't you, mate? Yeah. So you've then. gone from state ownership to state ownership, illegal state ownership this time. Well, this has now got a few <laughs> links behind it because Egg Bartley is the guy that's from Clear Lake. So there is an unofficial tie between them. And I think that they have been speaking to... I don't, I don't know. This is just what I've heard in like from somewhere. I think there has been like a chat and this happens behind the scenes. Like it happens a lot more than people would like to think that clubs talk to each other. And even though you think they're meant to be rivals, someone asks you, you're still going to listen. You're still going to help them out depending on who it is. I'm sure that this doesn't happen between like Arsenal and Tottenham, but it might happen between like Tottenham and no, somebody I else. Bet it definitely doesn't happen between Chelsea and Tottenham as well. No, no absolutely not. Um, how do you envisage Potter's team's plan is back three the best way for you yeah it must be i think everything seems to make sense doesn't it yeah with what you've got our squad is set up to to play a back three um if we think back to the brighton of last season so you and i are both sky players we know that they get they pass it around at the back they get a lot of those passes which for some reason has dropped off i'm expecting that to be back at chelsea i'm expecting the back three Hundreds of passes, kind of thing. Thiago Silva much deeper than the other two, like that. Douglas That's right. Bit of Brighton, yeah, I get it. And and the thing is, because even if he was thinking, oh, I might like try this or I might try that, as soon as you watch Thiago Silva, as soon as you train with him, you're like, okay, right, he's definitely in the team. Right, he is. He's still he's fantastic. Still yeah. yeah, that's it exactly. Um, so it is going to be the defense will be built around getting the best out of him, I imagine. So I'm expecting it to be a back three. I would assume it's going to be Koulibaly, Thiago Silva and uh, Fana. But, I mean, we don't know. First game's tomorrow night. 
Yes, which will certainly give us some clues against Salzburg, but I don't think it's just longer term answers. I, I'm on wild card, Gary, in FPL. Oh. How many Chelsea players should I have? Bearing in mind, obviously, you have no fixture this week, which we now know. Yeah, uh, one. And that is Rhys James. Rhys James, yeah. Still like, worth having? I'd say so. Like, I can't... The only thing would be if we decided to play a back four and really restrict him, but I don't know why you would do that. Like, well, the only other thing I'd say is what we've seen from Brighton over the last few months has been this Trossard left wing back position, which becomes really lopsided and changes where the right wing back does end up funneling into a right back position and does have the handbrake on a little bit. I've even heard, and I know this is going to make Gary grimace, the idea that Christian Pulisic could play that role quite well for Chelsea. Gary is grimacing for the audio listeners benefit, by the way, um, which I don't know. There's, there's little, little things like this. I think we need to see something first and the fixtures aren't amazing, not terrible, but Palace away in nine Wolves, Villa, Brentford, United, Brighton, Arsenal, Newcastle is your run between now and the World Cup. Yes, there's no City, Liverpool, Tottenham in there. And the big games, United, Arsenal are at home. Newcastle away is not easy. Brighton away is not easy. Palace away is not easy. It doesn't look great. It doesn't look terrible. Does that make sense? No, that's right. Um, going back to what you just said there as well, this is one of those things that will be interesting to see how Potter handles it. Because you might be able to tell Leandro Trossard, I want you to fulfil this different role. Well, Christian Pulisic thinks of himself as a front three player and he's the captain of his national team. See, when you try and tell him to fulfil a different role, he's like, well, I don't want to. I don't think I should have to. And we've seen that a lot. Do you really think that would be the case? He doesn't want to play wing back. If Tuchel's played him at wing back, he hates playing at wing back. He wants to play in the front three. But but I'm sure Trossard doesn't want to play wing back. But but essentially, it's it's wing back on name only. He's not actually playing wing back. He's actually playing the side forward. And I get that, yeah. And it could be that he could... Uh, show him well he would obviously go through tactically how he's going to be set up and go yeah as you say it's in name only you're going to be doing this but I think it is harder to do that with players of the status that we've got at Chelsea Ziyech thinks he's like the best player in Morocco in fact I think he probably is he's back in the squad apparently yeah that's Um, correct he he had a falling out with like the manager but like he he thinks a lot of himself and he is a great player he's an absolute fucking disaster when he plays for Chelsea but he is a <laughs> he's a great player he was an absolute disgrace in Zagreb he was like it's arguably the worst performance I've ever seen or the worst cameo that I've ever seen but I think it's harder to manage players like that and tell them I want you to fulfill this slightly different role and he's like but I well, want to do this yeah this is this is the challenge which to be fair it's, it almost feels um out of order to be judging Potter on it in the sense that it we don't know. He might come down down the route that say oh, he took Arteta a while, didn't it? Where Arteta yeah. eventually went, I need to get these people out yeah, rather than right. bowing to them and stuff. So, and we don't know how that's going to work with Potter. Whether he'll, if someone like Pudisic reacts that way and he just goes get out, or if he tries to work with it, I don't think any of us know. Um, no, we don't. Not at all. But I, I think it's that's one of the different. That's one of the main differences at Chelsea is that our players have got a bit more of an ego behind them. And this isn't, we're not talking about the days of like Lampard, Terry, Drogba, Cole and everything like that, but we're still talking about these players and maybe a little bit less receptive. I don't know. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. If you tell Pascal Gross that you're going to play here this week and then here this week and here this week, he's a little bit more like, all right, I'll do it. You tell that to uh, Hakim Ziyech and he's like, no, I'm a front three player. This is where I play. This is what I do. I always think they've done better, Brian. And I think we've seen this over the last few months where they've, when they've had a settled team. The team hasn't changed. They finished last season really well. They had a different a, a structure, but it stayed kind of the same. It's similar this year. You took Danny Welbeck out of the team for one game. They lost at Fulham. Uh, and there is going to be more rotational change about Chelsea because of the sheer volume of quality of numbers within that squad. So, Again, and he, how he many might, games we've got? We've got a lot well, more games than Brighton ever had. He might handle it absolutely brilliantly. It yeah. might be a problem. I, I just think that there's a little bit of a danger for Chelsea here, where it feels like they're committing to a longer term project. And I, I completely agree with you. He's the right man, Potter. I genuinely am so pleased that he's got this chance to manage a top club, and someone like him has been given it. I think it's right everyone person, should be, except the Brighton fans. Right time. Yeah, I, I, we'll we'll get Sam's opinion next week um, on Clash to Correspondence, how he's feeling about it. Um, but I, I do think there's a little bit of a danger here for Chelsea that they're committing to this, a 
as a long-term model when everything that we've learned over the last 20 years basically says that at a club of your size when something goes wrong change has to happen and I don't think I don't think Chelsea can get stuck into the idea of he's going to be here four years or or, or whatever well if it hits the fan like it's hit the fan with Tuchel you still need to change right well, it depends. Like, what do you mean by a club of our size? Because the club that he looks at the most, Burley, that he's talked about the most in his interviews from when he's taken over is Liverpool. Now, obviously, Liverpool are one of the two biggest clubs in the country. Like, by far, they're never going to be touched. They are the two biggest. But there are comparisons and like in terms of like stadium size and this kind of thing. And I think that is what he's looking at. He's looking at a, like a Jurgen Klopp type thing. Everybody would want a Klopp or, or Guardiola right. in terms of that long term. Exactly. Of course. I think that's that's what he's trying to do. And it might not work with Potter. It might be that in two years ago, all right, no, I'm, I'm he just was saying, the wrong man to do that. Yeah, no, no, I'm saying I think the danger might be that he flips so much the other way where Chelsea just stick too long if it, if it goes wrong. At the end of the day, does he goes in your squad, mate? And if there's yeah. a clash, and obviously if Potter does fall out with the board, then fine, that's different. But it doesn't matter if you lose the dressing room. It seems well, ridiculous to talk about it before he's even started, but I just think there's a danger that Chelsea gets stuck into thinking this is long term, we must go long term. Well, the funny thing That's is, all. like, and this is something that I've sort of alluded to without saying it in as in as many words, is the other place that there's like egos, if you will, is in the stands. We used to success. If yeah. we don't get the success, if we That's don't see right. the progress, like there's a lot of our fans are gonna be like, Oh, hang on, why have we why are we doing this? We were quite happy, thank you. We were winning the Champions League, Europa League, Premier League, everything like that. I quite like that. Like we want that back. So that is another like challenge for Potter and for the ownership. What are the owners going to do if the fans so, start turning against so Potter? Let's let's finish on this. What's what's your expectations for the remainder of this season for Chelsea? Expectations. What, what are you hope? happy with? What are you happy with? Happy the season with... finishes in May. What are you happy with? Top four, don't care about the Cups because I don't see us winning the Champions League. Okay, fine. Go forward another 12 months. What are you happy with? It's difficult to quantify because you're just thinking some sort of progress, aren't you? Like Now, whether or not that was that would be that, let's say that we went out in the round of 16 in the Champions League this year and then next year we went out in the semi-final. You think, okay, we're building towards something. Um, Again, with the league, I've, I think I've just got it in my mind at the moment that for as long as Guardiola's at City, they're just untouchable. I can't see how we're going to get above them. It's just, they're set up just perfectly. They just never seem to get it wrong. Their vulnerabilities seem to show when those around them are also showing vulnerabilities. And Liverpool being vulnerable at the moment might open up a few doors. It's true, because that, and that, this is one of the things that happened in like the uh, city of drawn first... at Villa. They've drawn at Newcastle. That's true. And we saw we saw this with like in the first like Mourinho spell that like Man United. We were just used to they win everything. Then Arsenal suddenly win a couple of things. Then Chelsea do it. And the team that Man United built off the back of that was just fucking phenomenal. The team that won three Premier Leagues in a row. Ferguson had never had to get his team to that standard before because the Premier League was basically like easy to them. They were just like pissing it in like 2000, 2001. So you're right. It does drive it up so when everybody then comes down they're like oh actually we can just win the league with like we can let go of five players and still win the title so maybe but we even sort of after City beat you in January it it looked like it was done they took mm. their eye off the ball didn't they the, the drop points at yeah. Palace at Southampton they lost to my team but you're saying they're they, they just bottled playing my team at the weekend you know we always go there and win mate right <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I only no. say that because I know it's not going to happen for a while. Um, so where would I be? Ha- so the, the question: Where would I be happy for next season? Yeah. Again, I'd want to see. Uh, it's just it's the progress is what you better want to than see. this season. Is the yeah, answer basically? That's so what I'm saying. If, if you finish fourth this year and finish yeah. fifth next year, is in trouble. Probably. Yeah. And it's more, as I say, from the fans, because the chances are as well. You, you can sit here, I can sit here relaxed and say, oh no, but it's fine because it's like he's a long-term thing or whatever. Wait until you lot and Arsenal start in our ear about how you finished above us and that we've come fifth and whatever. 
then see how much patience you want to give yeah, like, yeah, get the it, manager. Yeah. That's how it works in football. Yeah, at the end of the day. Like, yeah, no, no, it's absolutely right. Tottenham and Arsenal influence the mood of each other and stuff like that, and it would be the same with, with your team as well. No, that's I it. Because at the I moment, we can, we can just ignore you lot. You go, oh yeah, North London's white, North London's red. Yeah, well, fucking London's blue. So I don't give a fuck what you lot say. But that's if you start your, finishing above us, that's that's your opinion, regularly. Gary. Yeah, of course. We're entitled to it. Which right. is the last London gonna, team that's won every trophy. I said to Probably Gary before we started, this won't go on an hour. Yeah, well, what a <laughs> surprise. Um, Gary, thank you so much for your insight on, on Chelsea. Um, where can everyone follow you on the bird app, mate? At Phantom Antle, And I generally respond to people because I don't have a lot else to do with my life. So, yeah, send me a message. <laughs> Gary. Good luck, mate. Good luck against Salzburg. Good luck for the season, mate. Uh, right, next, uh, Suge is back tomorrow with myself for the latest Sky Fantasy Football podcast. And uh, we need to change our thinking quite quickly with these postponements and stuff. So plenty to talk about on that podcast tomorrow. But just leaves me to say, once again, thanks very much to Gary. Cue music, please, Manchild. <laughs>